Okay, well, I've just started the recording. Thank you to everybody who's managed to be here today. And I can see there's still a few people um, joining in. Welcome to your first uh, live online lecture, a little bit different from me releasing them on YouTube and sending them your way um, differently. So thank you for everybody who's made the time today. We're very fortunate today to welcome uh, Tim Wong, who is the child safety lead from Catholic Education Western Australia, a position he's held for um, quite a few years now. Uh, Tim and I worked in the same building back in the day um, uh, when I used to be there working in Catholic Education. So we do, we do know each other. Um, we are very fortunate to have his expertise with us today and Tim's going to take us through the topic of um, child safety and child protection um, and some of the strategies and pastoral responsibilities that teachers have in that space. Um, Tim, just for your knowledge, last week um, they all had an assessment, so they're all sort of breathing a sigh of relief at the moment, um, but they had right. most recently the content had been about teachers' responsibilities around uh, bullying prevention and intervention and strategies around that so um, and their legal responsibilities around duty of care so um, look Tim will guide you um, definitely through his content um, and at times Tim will also ask you lovely students to maybe engage and ask questions so please be brave please you know turn on your camera turn on your microphone and ask that burning question because no doubt four other people are probably thinking the same question and then it avoids that awkward silence then and then I'll feel like I have to ask a question so um so to those students who are still wearing their pajamas if you can maybe put a jumper on and then um when Tim invites you to ask a question this is a really good time uh to do that um I will do a acknowledgement of country and then I've just got one more bit of housekeeping and then I'll hand over to Tim so I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're learning upon today, wherever you are today. I'm currently in Fremantle, Walilak, um, and from wherever you are, that might have um, a different name or a different um, history. We extend respect to the enduring culture and customs of the Wajak Noongar people who have nurtured and nourished this country for generations and for whom country is sacred. Um, so my final piece of housekeeping, and I'm sure Tim will also do this, is just to um, remind you all that the content that we're going to cover today can be really sensitive and a bit triggering in nature. Um, and as we sort of mentioned in the tutorial, if you have um, other people around you in the space that you're in at the moment who may or may not be um, able to cope with some of the content, please make sure you're listening and tuning in uh, somewhere safe. Um, and particularly if there's little people um, in your world at the moment, it might be a good idea just to find someone else to look after them for the next 45 minutes or so. All right. And with that, Tim, I will hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jemima. Hi, everyone. Thanks for making the time to come out live. Um, I will be asking you to to, um, to participate. So uh, just to reiterate, um, please um, be brave and jump on. Now, I'm on a single screen today. Usually I've got some multiple screens and I can put the chat box up so I'll see when people put a, a, a question in the chat box, but I'm going to have to rely on Jemima to monitor chat for me. But I'm really, uh, really, would be really happy if you wanted to just unmute yourself and just um, ask a question. I'd say don't wait for a um, for a pause because we've got a lot of stuff to cover and I'm trying to cover it in 45 minutes. I've probably got a, uh, over an hour's worth of stuff which I'm going to try and get you out of, uh, out of here on time. So please feel free, interrupt at any time and we'll go from there. Um, let's just see if we can share the screen. Okay. Okay, I'm hoping you can see that slide for fish, um, child safety. Yeah. And um, cool, thanks. Let's just get into it. Just want to emphasize this is a lecture. This doesn't constitute it or substitute for any mandated training for when you get into a job in any of the education sectors. Um, it, it does point you towards a lot of that information, but you, you have to make sure that you do the training that's prescribed there. These are the current training requirements. Department of Education have online training that's completed every three years. In, in Catholic schools, in Catholic WA, where I'm from, uh, you have to complete our training in child protection uh, 
procedures of mandatory reporting annually. That's online. Uh, as same similar thing with independent schools, there's a training uh, that you need to complete annually, and that's for us to make sure that we're are meeting the non-government schools registration standards. Uh, you might ask, why do Department of Education staff um, have to complete it only every three years? Well, we're asking the minister that same thing. But anyway, that's how it is at the moment. So child safety, we're going to discuss some key issues and practice in child safety and try and get, get through that in a uh, nice amount of time. I'm going to look at my, actually, camera's off. So I'm going to look at my watch again. I'm going to try and make sure we get out of here in a, in a reasonable time. But as Jemima said, and just to reiterate, a bit of self-care, if any of this um, information is a, is a little bit sensitive to you, please feel free to, to take some time out or come back if you can. Um, and just make sure that you're, uh, you're accessing your um, trust network to, to um, just chat about things uh, and make sure that you reach out for help if you need. Otherwise, be brave and the, the content, be brave with the content. And um, yeah, let's have, a, let's have a, a, a go at this. So particularly in education, when you're working particularly with, the, you know, with early childhood, we've got to have some really, uh, we've got to get our priorities in, in order. And I would say to us that our priority, our number one is that the best interest of the child, the young person must be the paramount consideration. Now, this is uh, the first principle under which the Community Services Act uh, was written. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about the Children and Community Services Act, but keep this in mind as we're going through, because this will help you with your decision-making when you're out in the field, when you're in, in your first job and you're presented with a dilemma, you've always got to come back to this. What's in the best interest of the child or young person um, that I'm dealing with? So I'm going to hit you with a little bit of a, um, a scenario. We've got six-year-old Zach, and we're going to progress with Zach as we go through the the lecture. So, so let's, to start off with, six-year-old Zach comes up to you and says he wants to tell you something, but you can't tell anyone else. What do you do? So any thoughts, anyone? Just uh, unmute yourself. We're looking for that first brave person. Browning points for me if you do. Even what's your first thought? Not not necessarily what's your what do you do, but what's your first thought here? No. We got anyone who's able to no. jump in? Normally I awkwardly eyeball them in the classroom, Tim, but I'm unable to do that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you want to put it in something in the chat, ch chuck something in the chat and Jemima can read it out yeah. for me. I'm monitoring the chat just in case. Remembering I'm a psychologist, so I'm very comfortable with silence. <laughs> oh, we've, we've had one in the chat, Tim, that says, depending on what it is, which is an interesting point. Okay, yeah. Any Any advances on depending on what it is? Thank you to Taylor. Um, someone else has said, don't make a promise to keep the secret. Someone else has said, don't promise Zach that you won't tell anyone, which is the same thing. So those, those two ladies have um, mentioned, you know, don't say to Zach that you can keep a secret. Someone has said it heavily depends on the content as children will sometimes say completely random things and otherwise important information. Um, someone else has said, if it's something that might need to be reported to the authorities, so they're thinking about the teacher's obligations as far as reporting goes. Yep, yep. You, we've sensitised you because this is all about professional responsibilities, right? But um, those first two or three responses dead on, you don't promise that you can't, won't tell anyone else, but you go, tell me more. Oh, oh Zach, okay, yeah, I'm happy for you to tell me. Can't necessarily not tell anyone else, but yeah, just tell me more. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to come back to Zach uh, uh, in, in a few slides time, and we're going to add on to uh, that interaction. So let's take it step by step, but uh, really good um, first responses. 
Just want to quickly point out national principles for child safe organisation. So you might or might not remember the Royal Commission in, into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. I just call it the Royal Commission from now on. Um, came out with a number of recommendations. And one of the recommendations were that there were a nationally consistent set of principles for child safe organisations. That was taken up uh, by uh, all of the governments, all of the state governments and the federal government, and they agreed on these national principles for child safe organisations. So if you Google them, you can, you'll find the 10 national principles. Um, and these are the 10 national principles there. Uh, I'll, I'll let you read through that at your leisure because um, that's something you can come back to. Just as a little bit of an ad for Catholic Ed, so Catholic Ed at the same time was developing it, uh, its child safe framework and at about the same time that uh, the Royal Commission released its final report, Catholic Ed launched its uh, child safe framework and you, you can see it's got nine elements. So nine elements rather than ten principles but same thing, we've mapped our, our child safe framework elements to all the principles and, and it covers the same thing, it says the same thing um, just in a slightly different way but it's still consistent with those principles. One thing, if you haven't um, heard about it or you haven't checked it out, is the Australian Child Maltreatment Study, which came out in 2023, and there's been a bit of a roadshow um, uh, talking about it. Um, I've got the link there. Uh, really important piece of work in that it's probably the most uh, thorough, I, I guess, um, piece of research looking at the prevalence of, um, of child maltreatment in Australia uh, in terms of the sample size, very, very large sample size. So they basically surveyed a whole lot of adults uh, from 16 uh, to 65 plus and, and asked them a number of questions. And so it it's, it's gives us a really good picture of, uh, of prevalence in Australia. These are the maltreatment subtypes that they used in the uh, child maltreatment study and it's always important to you know in terms of definitions when we're talking about uh, any sort of statistics in terms of or, or studies it's important about how you define your terms and these are the sorts of when I use um, the terms physical sexual emotional abuse neglect etc these are the sorts of um, definitions that I'll be that I'll be I guess referring to um, the other part is you can see down the bottom exposure to domestic violence now more and more in the literature and the research, uh, researchers are, I guess, drawing out exposure to, to domestic violence as a fifth subtype of, of maltreatment. Although I have to say that in a lot of the states, um, although it's recognised, it's, it's usually placed in the practitioner's manual underneath emotional abuse. But it's important for us to all realise and be aware of um, the the negative effects, the, the trauma that's associated with just exposure to domestic violence, whether or not the acts are directed at the child or at other members of the family, that's there's still the same sort of uh, uh, effects um, of the trauma as all the other maltreatment subtypes. So a few figures for you. So again, this is from the child maltreatment study. They found that in their survey of, of Australians aged 16 to 65, two thirds, nearly two thirds had experienced at least one type of child maltreatment. And that's an enormous amount of people walking around who have, uh, who have experienced child maltreatment. Um, obviously there's, they're on a continuum in terms of, of the, the effects or the trauma, but there's, they pulled out a lot of effects in terms of uh, mental health, in terms of uh, relationships, social, emotional, um, functioning, all that sort of thing. Uh, there's a lot of effects that they pulled out in this child maltreatment survey that um, being subjected to child maltreatment uh, affected uh, in significant ways. And here's the breakdown of what they found in the Australian Child Maltreatment Study of all the various subtypes. And you can see they're all still quite high. So if we look at 28.5% of, of, um, of uh, Australians aged 16 to 65 in the sample size uh, experienced sexual abuse growing up. So again, it's getting up to that third 
uh, nearly a third uh, experienced physical abuse. You know, you can see the high rates of emotional abuse, less so for a neglect, but still, you know, 8.9%. And see that nearly 40% experienced exposure to, to domestic violence. And when we think about all the health outcomes, the mental health and health outcomes, um, we, we, we're really looking at, um, I guess, epidemic type uh, after effects um, of, of adverse childhood experiences that uh, need a lot of work in terms of the whole community, in terms of government, all levels of government and community in terms of intervening. So if we then narrow down, so this is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and we go, which form of child abuse is most substantiated? And what does that mean? That means that uh, when there are, um, are reports to child protection, so this is across Australia, when there are reports, reports to child protection and child protection um, uh, investigates the case, and then it makes the threshold for substantiation by, by child protection then this is what goes into these statistics. So it's um, likely an underrepresentation, as you can see from the previous slide, um, in terms of substantiations. But um, it's still uh, a little bit different, isn't it? When you, if I'll just quickly flick back, when you look at 8.9% of um, respondents in the Australian Child Maltreatment Survey uh, said that they had experienced neglect. But when we look at, um, the substantiations in 20, 21, 22, that was up at around the 21%. And you can see by far the most substantiated form of child abuse or child maltreatment is emotional abuse. And if you look at this next slide, it looks at uh, children with substantiated maltreatment by age group. So you can see again, um, children who have been substantiated to be, have been maltreated, uh, 14.7% in the less than one age group. So babies and infants are, are um, the, the largest group of uh, where maltreatment occurs. And you can see as a, as a trend, child maltreatment actually starts to slowly decrease as a child gets older. Okay, let's, uh, unless there's any questions uh, or thoughts or, or burning uh, comments anyone wants to make before we move on. Okay, so the act uh, that, that governs uh, child protection in this state is called the Children and Community Services. And I, I just want to talk about the Children and Community Services Amendment. So within the Children and Community Services Act, it talks about mandatory reporting um, of child sexual abuse. And as you can see, there was a, a amendment. So back in 2009, um, there, there was an amendment that uh, then made teachers, doctors, nurses, midwives, police, uh, mandatory reporters of child sexual abuse. So man a mandatory report by definition in Western Australia is only that of uh, sexual abuse. All other forms of abuse are not subject to the mandatory reporting legislation, but uh, see, see your policy in terms of the organisation you work for, and you'll see that all forms are, uh, must, be, must be reported un under policy. Boarding supervisors are there with an asterisk because they came along in 2016. So there was a further amendment to the Act, which then brought um, uh, boarding supervisors in under the list of, of uh, groups of, of reporters. Um, now, that was the amendment back in 2008. There was an amendment in 2021, which then expanded mandatory reporters or groups of mandatory reporters, sorry, to these people. So youth justice workers, early childhood workers, psychologists, school counsellors, ministers of religion, and all department of community staff. So rather than um, introduce each of these groups all at once, there was a staged rollout in the amendment bill. And you can see some of these, um, some of these mandatory reporter groups have already become mandatory reporters. You can see most notably ministers of religion. And the legislation, interestingly, um, does not allow for, um, for the seal of confession. So if a minister of religion forms the belief that um, child abuse has been, has occurred because of a disclosure in confession, he is bound by the law to make a mandatory report. And you can see all these others. Assessors and departmental officers are basically um, other department and community staff. 
um, as well as out of home care workers. Um, the biggest one coming up is in May 2024, so a couple of months ago, and that's where school counsellors and psychologists like myself will become mandatory reporters. And then later on this year in November, early childhood workers, and then rounding out with youth justice workers next year in May 2025, will all become mandatory reporters of child sexual abuse. So defining sexual abuse, the uh, the legislation, the Children's Services Act has a, has a definition, and it's this one. Sexual abuse uh, is in relation to a child includes sexual behaviour in circumstances where, and there's A, B, and C. So it's important if you are a mandatory reporter, if or you become a mandatory reporter, that you come back to this definition. And it's got three main elements to it. One is that there needs to be sexual behaviour there. It needs to involve a child. And a child is defined under the act as someone who's under the 18 or in the absence of evidence to the contrary, someone who appears to be under the age of 18. And then the third part is A, B or C need to be, need to be, um, need to be present. So they, they must be the subject of bribery, coercion, a threat, exploitation or violence, or there's a power differential with the other person involved, or there's a, a disparity in the development, functional maturity of the child with the other person involved. So it's really handy to come back to this every time uh, you um, you uh, are faced with um, wondering or deciding whether child whether you have a belief of child sexual abuse. Who do you report to? Make sure you check your policy and procedures of, of your organisation. But in terms of sexual abuse, it's directly to the mandatory reporting unit within Child Protection uh, Department of Communities, Child Protection and Family Support. And then all other forms of abuse are, go to central intake. So it's all Department of Communities, Child Protection, Family Support, but they're different teams that, that take them. And if you're working a care service, you must also uh, report that to ECRU. So you guys would be full body on ECRU. Just a quick um, nod to uh, education care services, but I, I'm sure you've, you've um, seen this part before. Okay, let's go back to Zach. Zach has told you, remember in the first part, Zach told you he had a secret, not to tell anyone. You've said, hey, tell me more, but not promising anything. And then Zach tells you that Braden, an eight-year-old student he often plays with. Now, remember Zach was, is six, made him do sex. So what do you do now? Either unmute or put it in the chat. Any ideas? I haven't got any to all. Oh, hang on. One's has said, get more information. Great. Okay, we'll run with that. Now, normally if we had time, I'd say, how do you get more information? But what's really important here is that you don't make any assumptions on what Zach means by doing sex. Because it'd be very easy for us to go, oh, Braden tried to have sex with Zach. But we don't know what Zach understands by sex. So a big thing, so bang on in terms of that. So I see there's another couple of responses. What else, Jemima? Um, we've got try and get as much information as you can without causing harm. Someone else has said talk to Braden, and another person has said seek help from my principal or line manager. All of the above. Well done, guys. So what I'd be saying is, oh, Zach, tell me more about that when you say do sex or describe that to me or um, what does that mean? So what you notice is they're all open questions. It's a tell me more, explain that more, or, you know, describe that to me. Um, we won't necessarily talk to Braden yet. We want to just clarify really what Zach means by doing sex. But we will chat to Braden at some stage, depending on what, we, what Zach tells us. Okay, first thing to do is to keep calm with this sort of thing. So when we're dealing with a disclosure or, or what we think is going to be a disclosure, we want to make sure we ask questions but don't investigate. And so we use what, what we call the TED questions. Tell me more, explain that more to me, describe that more for me. Um, make sure you don't use um, leading questions. Or did, did Braden touch you on your penis? That sort of thing. That's a leading question. We just want to go describe that more. Explain that to me. What does that mean? So make sure you keep open. So we're not investigating, we're clarifying. Because think about it this way. If you're going to explain this to another adult, 
you need enough information to because uh, say uh, so a lot of schools will ring me up to say oh tim we're not sure if this is a mandatory report we're not sure what to do in this and i'll ask some clarifying questions what did zach mean by do sex and if you haven't asked then you've nearly missed an opportunity because if you have to go back and talk to, to zach zach's six and think about put yourself in the remember when you were six and a teacher comes back to you about something that you you told them you're going to think you're in trouble or that someone's in trouble and you're going to shut up or you're going to change your story or, or do all sorts of things so in the moment it's really important to keep calm and use some open questions to clarify just enough so that you you can explain it to another adult i don't know if, uh, i'm hoping that makes sense so let's talk about problematic and harmful sexual behavior um as you can see police data in 2017 so this was a, a little while ago of all the reports about allegations of child sexual abuse a minor was the person of interest or the alleged person responsible in 70 percent of those cases we also got to remember though that children with harmful sexual behavior differ from adult child sex offenders we shouldn't lump them in the same way because oftentimes children with harmful sexual behaviors are either uh, processing stuff that's happened to them in terms of sexual behavior or are just trying out oftentimes there's misguided curiosity all those sorts of things what we do find is that there's a range of causes for harmful sexual behavior and it's not always that they've been sexually abused themselves in fact that's not that's not the leading cause usually the leading um i guess correlation would be some some form of trauma so they might have been maltreated in some other way uh, not necessarily sexual and they they boundaries and all that sort of thing has been mucked up and so then they're they're exhibiting harmful sexual behavior so what we need to do is because it's different from child sex offenders who, who we might lock up and put in specialized um, uh, treatment programs we need a tailored intervention for children with harmful sexual behavior depending on the severity down the low end of severity we would look at behavioral interventions Remembering also not all sexual behavior is harmful. And I'm going to show you a continuum in, in a second, which, which sort of uh, talks to that. And language matters. So rather than talking about this in terms of uh, uh, perpetrators and victims, we talk about the child who displayed harmful sexual behavior and the child who experienced the, the um, or, or was the target of, of, child, of harmful sexual behavior because we want to take this away from a, what I call the law and order response. We go, oh, that child perpetrated sexual abuse. But it wasn't necessarily sexual abuse because if we look back at the definition, there might not have been that power differential. There might not have been coercion. It might have been just play that was a little bit inappropriate. So we have to be very careful with our language, particularly when we're talking with parents because parents are going to react in certain ways. Um, they, they're going to be understandably very, very distressed about what's happening for their child so we have to be mindful about how neutral we can be um, so that we can put in place good, good interventions so this is one um, one uh, definition what happens at there's a national clinical reference group at the moment which is working on a, a nationally consistent definition for harmful sexual behaviors so that's still in draft so i can only give you something that's that's um very approximating and it might be might look different um when it finally comes out from the national from the uh national clinical reference group but we're looking at behaviors of a sexual nature that are outside what we would typically expect for an age um also may involve obsessive um it might, might be obsessive it might involve those coercive aggressive sort of um uh aspects to it uh, or it might involve a substantial difference in age or developmental ability remember with same age peers if one peer has a uh an intellectual disability then the the peer who who's um who has average you know average ability or average co co cognitive ability might has that advantage over them so in, in um engaging them in sexual behavior um there's there's not that element of, of being able to to understand what it is so that's where that is so this is all alls um it's not and okay so is outside uh, what's what's accepted or is obsessive or involves a substantial difference 
that's just a working definition at the moment. Keep a watch out for probably, I would say, the end of this year or sometime this year for a definition to come out from the National Clinical Reference Group. The trouble with looking at uh, that sexual behaviours is that, as I've been alluding to, is they happen on a continuum where we have behaviours that are clearly okay, they're, they're normal or what to expect for the age of the child. Then up the other end, there's ones that are clearly not okay. So they're not normal, they're abusive or half of they, they have those elements of coercion, aggression, violence, that sort of thing. They're clearly not okay. But then we have this in the middle, this grey area where we're going, oh, I'm not sure, is this normal, is this not, is this harmful, is this not, that sort of thing. And the other added layer to this is that for each of us, that middle area changes depending on our own upbringing, our own training, our own experience. Yep. Um, okay. Thanks everybody for coming back. Sorry for the interruption, the joys of uh, free Zoom. <laughs> Yes, this is it. This is where we're okay. Going. So, okay. So, as I was saying, um, that that part in the middle, the grey area, is is the I guess the biggest pain area for staff because it it it, it differs according to your your family of origin, to your upbringing, to your cultural, religious, all that sort of thing. And we've got to try and have a way that we can have a I guess a shared understanding. Um, shared understanding here in terms of that. So with that in mind, um, the Department of Communities commissioned uh, the Australian Centre for Child Protection, ACCP, uh, and it, the, the Deputy Chair of Practice, um, Amanda Payton, to develop this framework of understanding. I'm just going to try and... Yep. Um, this framework for understanding guiding responses to harmful sexual behaviours of children and young people. This is in your handout, which Jemima will upload. So there's a QR code, all that sort of thing. I just wanted to point you point this out to you. I also want to say that um, from an education point of view, um, across the different sectors, Department of Education, Catholic Ed and ASWA, we've gotten together to kind of uh, take that framework, which was meant only for internal use with department communities, but it's still useful. And we've adapted it for education. Now this will come out in some way, shape or form this year for Catholic Ed uh, staff. But also um, in the meantime, in the background, there's a research project that's been, uh, that's been commissioned by the Department of Communities for, uh, involving Amanda Payton with ACCP to, to develop a WA-wide um, framework for responding to, child's, uh, to childhood sexual behaviours. And that will come out, that, that's due for delivery um, at the end of the year. So watch this space, there's a lot of work going on about it, going on in it. So what I'm gonna show you here is pillar two of this framework um, that was developed by Amanda Payton and Leah Bromfield. And, I don't know if any of you have been reading any other literature which looks at the traffic light system. So we used to have a traffic light system, red, orange and green, in terms of dividing up um, sexual behaviours into what's acceptable, you know, what's concerning, what's very concerning. And so the evolution of that has come to this, understanding this, this, this what's called a layered continuum. And you can see across the top, talks about developmentally appropriate, developmentally inappropriate, then, then goes into two concerning, very concerning, serious, extreme behaviours. But also below, on the um, left-hand side, and I'm gonna go, put this over a few slides, is there's other layers to this in terms of um, being able to look at a behaviour and go, is this developmentally appropriate? Is it not appropriate or, or should we, we be concerned here? So there's that general description. So you can see the general description for developmentally appropriate. It's expected for, for a child's developmental stage. It's kind of socially acceptable and it's aligned with community expectation. So for a very young kid, a four or five year old kid, and particularly little boys that like to hold onto their penises outside their shorts when they're standing around, that's just, that's just part and parcel of that sort of age. And so we might just gently um, uh, correct them and say, hey, at school, you know, hand, hands off hands off your penis there. Uh, whereas development inappropriate, it might be that they're starting to touch each other. You know, curiosity is normal, but then going in and touching each other, we're sort of going, that's inappropriate. It's not 
anything to be really uh, in the absence of coercion or that sort of thing. It's 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 not something to get really worried about. We just make sure that we we redirect and, and correct that. And then you can see all those other um, general descriptions for concerning, very concerning, serious, extreme. I want to say that at a um, a worker level, though, we'd probably look at this and chunking it into developmentally appropriate developmental inappropriate and concerning very concerning serious extremists chunked into into one sort of section where we go anything falls into that then we would be as as one of you said before we'd be talking to someone up line about it so you can see we looked at sorry we looked at general description then we're going persistency and frequency so remember obsessiveness is is another feature about harmful sexual behavior so we want to see does this persist so something that's developmentally appropriate if it persists despite um, despite uh, good correction, uh, explicit correction, then we might start to get a bit more concerned because it might slip into developmentally inappropriate or concerning because it, it's it start to be driven by uh, that obsessive compulsive behaviour, that sort of thing. So this persistency and frequency is another uh, layer or, or factor that we look at. We also look at if it includes another young person, what's the ex what's what's um the implication for that young person so again having a look at each other's privates when you're four three four five year old um is is fairly de uh, developmentally expected uh, for that age kids are kids are uh, at that age are curious about each other about their body and they're curious to know whether other people's parts look the same as their parts that sort of thing so you can see that um it tends to be not in the legal sense consensual but they're going hey you want to look at my thing i'll look at your thing yeah sure let's do that um then there might be the development inappropriate talks about possible self-induced pressure they might not really want to show but because another kid's asking they do it anyway and there's a little bit more of the early warning signs there going into those you know concerning very concerning extreme that sort of thing with the inequality in, in power the coercion, threats, violence, exploitation, that sort of thing. And then the emotional experience. So that's the final layer of this in terms of this. So you look at that generally when it's developmentally appropriate, it's and it's mutual, they're kind of giggling, they're laughing along with it. When you um, when you you catch them, they might laugh and just run off and not do it again. Um, there might be an element of embarrassment if it was developmentally inappropriate, which means they kind of know that it's a little bit wrong. And then you get anger, guilt, all those sorts of uh, other emotions when it gets up into the more concerning, very concerning. So you can see, and this will be coming out, um, as I said, this year. And then again, it, it, a further evolution of it with the WA framework. But you can see how there's, there's a few more factors that, that you can look at in terms of determining whether a behaviour is within that middle grey area or whether it's developmentally appropriate or not appropriate. So let's then move back to Zach. Zach tells you that Brayden made him go into the toilet and said to put his mouth on the older boy's willy. Now I'll put it in inverted commas because it's important to use the language that the child says. Don't, don't put an adult filter on it. You always go back and try and be as verbatim as possible when you're talking about the accounts for kids, okay? So then Zach refused. Braden pulled his own pants down and insisted that he did it, do it, as in put his mouth on, on his willy. What do you do now? Um, in the chat, or feel free to uh, um, feel free to unmute. Just give them a couple of minutes. We we only lost four attendees. We've got 18 at the moment. We had 22 in the first video. So um, hopefully some people are having a bit of a think at the moment. It's it's okay if you want to say, I want to consult with my upline. Mm. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What you've got to do when you... I think while, while we're waiting for people to, to um, put something in the chat, uh, one thing you've got to think, as with the last part, is can I explain this to someone else if they wanted to ask? Are there any clarifying questions to ask? And one of them would be 
don't assume Willie means the same for you as it does for Zach. So you might go, what do you mean by Willie? And even if he doesn't have to say penis, he could say, oh, what, what you we out of? And you go, okay, now I've got a really clear picture that he, he's using the word Willie to mean penis. So oh, we've got a chat, someone? Yeah. Um, so Brianna has said, look, document this and bring it to the principal's attention. And then together you might report that to the higher authority. Yep, definitely. Uh, I like how you go, went documented and document as verbatim as possible what was said. Um, and yeah, uh, and, and consult up is, is the big thing. If you're unsure, always, always consult up. Braden pulled his own pants down and insisted he do it. So you might might just say, tell me more, just to see if there's anything more, any more clarification. If there's not, that's fine. There's the, you know, you go with what you've got. Okay. So some useful responses for, for you. As we said, stay calm. If it's appropriate, and not in this case, in this case, it's not appropriate to try and divert or distract. But one thing that's really important in, in this in this top point uh, is to go, not to sort of go, oh, that was the wrong thing to do. Braden should be doing, shouldn't be doing it. Say, oh, okay, thank you so much for telling me. But we're going to have to have a look into this, that sort of thing. So don't, um, so you, you might state the behaviour is inappropriate, um, particularly if, and again, with with this, you might be a little bit more circumspect about it because you have to do a little bit more, a um, little bit more background work with consulting upline or not. But say, say Zach and Braden the same age, and they said, "Oh yeah, we were looking at each, each other's willies." You, you would go, "Okay, um, you know, we don't look at each other's each other's penises or sexual parts in in school." Okay. Um, we make sure we keep our pants on and, or, you know, or whatever in the toilets. Uh, you, you don't look at other people's and, and leave it at that. So you make sure you're very explicit on, on uh, correcting the behaviour. You've already said make written notes, well done. Consult with your principal, well done. Involve authorities where appropriate. So you might have a look at this and go, if you gather enough information, you may have reasonable grounds for a belief. And in which case then it might trigger um, the the obligation to submit a mandatory report. But always do this. You don't have to decide this by yourself. Always make sure you're, you're um, consulting upline. Okay, for the last, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go a, a few minutes over time. I'll ask your indulgence, feel free to, to leave if you have to go, if you've got someone to, to go, but I'll just very quickly cover um, the part that code of conduct has to, has to play in all of this. Now, Professor Stephen Smallbone, um, testified a couple of times before the Royal Commission. And one of his bits of testimony, he said, so sorry, Professor Stephen Smallbone, um, he talked a lot about uh, um, situational prevention from, which comes from the criminology literature, where it, it looks at what do we do, rather than focusing on offender behavior, what do we do about the environment to make it less, less inviting to be able to do the wrong thing and also make it, make it harder to for that behavior to be hidden so may increase the ability for um, the organization to spot bad behavior and he said the more the more research i do into this area because he identified that it's not there's not just one type of child sex offender there, it, it's not a homogenous group and we always think about child sex offenders as as people who what I call the focused offenders, they're the ones that we call pedophiles who who are sexually attracted to to um, to young people and and go out of the what their way to to create opportunities to sexually offend. There, he said there are people who are doing it opportunistically and because of situations that sort of thing. And he said the more research I do, the more I come to the conclusion that any person, given the right circumstances, is capable of abusing a child. Now, I'd almost guarantee that none of you um, heard or read any reference to that in the Royal Commission, which was really weird that the, the media didn't report on it because it's quite a confronting, uh, um, confronting quote, saying that in the right circumstances, anyone's capable of abusing a child. And so what he was talking about was that if we don't have the right situational prevention in place, then, yeah, that, that's going to be almost inevitable. Um, very quickly take you through case study number two. Now, these slides are not in the, 
in the handout that I gave you, but it's easy for you to go look it up. Uh, Jonathan Ward um, was a, a casual childcare assistant with the YMCA, um, and he became a coordinator at one of their um, one of their centres in 2010. Um, now, the thing about this is that people who maltreat kids oftentimes are, come across as great people. So this is what he was described by his colleagues, you know, great person to work, kids love him, really positive, popular, always make a big effort, you know, one of those people you could really count on to, to go the extra mile. However, have a look at this. On a number of occasions, he rubbed the penises of the victims while they were sitting on his lap. He committed other offence while babysitting children from the centre, which was especially prohibited in the, um, in the policy and procedures. And another work observed that the photo on his phone screensaver was a child in the centre. And when asked about it, he goes, oh, but I love them so much. So, you know, if it's not raising the, the hairs on the back of your neck, you know, it, it should be. So he was, uh, he was convicted of a number of offences involving children. And oftentimes he did this, um, not just at the centre, but while he was babysitting for clients at the centre who thought, here's a really great worker, uh, will you come and babysit for us? Because we think we can, we can trust you. There was all of this policy and procedure which was in place, but it wasn't being enforced. And this is, this is the point, I think, when it comes to the code of conduct. Um, so all of this, all, all of this policy, policy and procedure is useless unless you're actually um, policing it and enforcing it. So this is, this is the, I think, is the takeaway from case study number two. So how does a code of conduct help our practice? It, it's about us modeling healthy, respectful relationships to our kids. So that, uh, again, Dr. Stephen Smallbone was talking about uh, teaching protective behaviors and, and he, was, he was putting forward some criticisms of, of protective behaviors, um, uh, education, which are all valid. And the commissioner asked him, well, you know, what, what would actually be preventative for, um, for our kids in terms of education? And he said, we need to teach our kids to choose right relationships. And so that's where we're saying, the only way to do that is to model it. So, and we need this, this consistent approach, hence the code of conduct. So have a look at those. Um, and particularly that ensure you're prepared to challenge ambiguous behavior. We've got to remove, when we're working with children on the front line, such as in education and care services, we need to make sure that our behaviour as workers is unambiguous or as unambiguous as possible. And where it is ambiguous, we have to try our best to mitigate that and take the ambiguity out. So our obligation is educate yourself on indicators of child abuse and neglect. Educate yourself about what's expected in terms of problematic health and sexual behaviour. Have a look at that continuum in your own time. Understand our, the effects, understand your obligation and the law and make sure you practice self-care. Um, I know I'm five minutes over, but any questions, thoughts, concerns? I'll let you know while you might be write something. Yep. Uh, while you're having a think of that, just a whole lot of resources and links for you, which are in the handouts. Um, uh, e Safety Commission is a really good resource for staff and for um, teachers. And um, only if you want to really nerd out, read it, read some of the Royal Commission stuff. Otherwise, thank you all for your participation today. And thanks for letting me go a little bit over time. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, really appreciate uh, your contribution. And we're lucky to um, actually get you. Like, you know, your, your time is precious and we appreciate that. So, um, and apologies for those people who got cut off and then had to rejoin again. I'll stitch the videos together. Um, students, if you wanted to either just maybe turn on your microphone and just say thanks to Tim, um, or if you want to write thanks to him in the chat, I'm sure he would really appreciate that. Um, and look after yourself. Some of the content as we discussed was some heavy content and we will, I will see you all tomorrow in tutorials. Thank you so much. Well, you got lots of thank yous. All too. the best, everyone. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm having a look at them now. Thank you. Awesome. See you guys. Bye. See ya.